Welcome to Crosslink Community Church Podcast, where we prize Jesus, make disciples, and love people well. We are so glad you're here, and wherever you're listening from, we believe you will be more acquainted with the heartbeat of God through today's message. Hey, good morning. Hey, we're starting a new series. We're not back in Philippians. Um, I, I want to first say um, uh, a deep thank you for uh, Scott and Billy. I, I had the opportunity to listen to both of their messages as I was driving. And uh, man, you guys did an awesome job. Thank you so much for filling in. Um, as, as a pastor, it's, I love knowing that I can get away and, and trust those who stand up here with their microphone to teach you the good news about Jesus. And so they did an excellent job. Um, and so thank you for that. Worship team, thank you. All of you who serve and have kept this thing going, uh, thank you so much. And uh, But it is, it's good to be here. Um, this new series will take us through the summer, uh, at least. Uh, but it's one of those, uh, instead of going through a book of the Bible, um, where you may, like, if you come in and out because of your travel plans that, that you feel like you'll miss something, uh, this one uh, is a little different. Um, it's going to be a little bit more topical. However, we are going through just one chapter of the Bible for the rest of the summer. Um, and uh, that chapter, by the way, if you'd like to turn there, is Hebrews chapter 11. Um, our new series is called Faith Over Failure. Um, and so what we're going to end up doing is walk through um, Hebrews chapter 11, which is kind of the uh, hall of faith, as some would say, but all the men and women of the Old Testament um, who walked by faith. And, uh, and what we're going to do is um, we're going to read about them in Hebrews chapter 11 and then uh, one by one or at sometimes uh, group by group, go back to their stories in the Old Testament, their real life encounters and events and see how did they one get listed in Hebrews chapter 11, um, what their faith looked like, uh, and to show you and I that everyone in this list had um, a, a myriad of failures and fears and traumatic experiences. Um, and, and so what I want us to understand as we go through this is that faith, trusting in God, in Jesus, doesn't promise to get you through this life unscathed from failure, unhindered by fear or even untouched by tragedy. But what faith will do is it allows us to navigate the ups and downs of this life the twists and turns, and by moving our eyes off of what's temporal and onto what is eternal. So that as circumstances don't look as promising as we would like them to be, um, our eyes are not on our circumstances, they're on what is eternal. That when the voices around us start to tell us that God's promises won't come true, we know and are certain through our faith in scriptures and in his words that they are true. And even if it doesn't match up with where we currently are, we know that God is very much there, aware, and moving in our midst. And so I, I'm excited to, to walk through this um, because the faith that we have presents a hope and faith and hope are completely different, all right? Faith uh, kind of uh, initiates this hope in our life to give you and I a sure anchor for our soul. Um, the difference, as we will see, um, in the hope we understand um, currently compared to the hope in the Bible is that most of us will assume that hope is similar to, as you get ready for the NFL to begin, that you are hopeful that your team will actually do something this year. Or, or, or if we could go to college football for a moment, that you're hopeful that the Buckeyes will not miss a f Never mind. <laughs> too soon, um, that, that, that you, you are hopeful in something that is uncertain. Here's what's crazy. Biblical hope is, is a uh, kind of this um, uh, faith in something that is certain. So we may not see it right now, but it's not something that's questioned or uncertain, but it's a hope that is certain that God will still be victorious and will always be. And so it provides this anchor for our soul. Um, faith is an interesting thing, by the way. Um, what's, what I find fascinating is it's used over 240 times in Scripture, depending on which translation you have. It's only used twice in the entire Old Testament. Twice. Yet, we get to Hebrews chapter 11, and we see all the men and women of the Old Testament 
that are being identified as men and women who had faith. And I would contend, if, if I was my own conjecture, that the reason why we don't see the word faith in the Old Testament is because from Genesis chapter 1 and 2 and on, what you have is not a question whether God existed or not, but that he certainly did exist and that it wasn't faith as much as it was, do I choose to obey him or not? It, be, it was so certain in God's existence. And the further we get from the creation, the further we move away from that, the more faith needs to be initiated because now what we have are groups of people. And when Jesus arrived on the scene, are groups of people that started to believe that maybe, maybe God isn't the only God. Maybe he doesn't exist. Maybe the biggest step for us is to believe in God instead of truly just to believe God and that his words are true. And so we'll see that unfold, I think, over this summer. So if you've struggled with faith, um, this will be, be a good summer for you. And I would contend that most of us in this room have had moments where faith has been difficult, whatever it is. Um, we'll do it this way. While we were on vacation, um, we, went to, we went to a water park. Ah, yeah. This is fun. Um, we went to this water. We went to it last year. I told you about last year because it has the most amazing lazy river that's not so lazy. Um, and, and we, we had to go back. Like the one thing we asked our kids when we go to Tennessee, what do you want to do? Water park. Perfect. Me too. And so it's always great when the kids' plans align with the dads. And so, um, we, uh, uh, we went to this water park. And last year when we went, they're, they're building this slide, this new one that was, beautiful, gorgeous, amazing. And so when we got there this year, it was open. And so we got there early. I, I was like, we got to get there when the park opens so we can get to this ride because I don't like to wait in lines. Never. Like, I'm not patient. And so we get there. We run over to the slide and it is open. However, only one, there's two slides. They're, they're like this dueling like thing. And only, only one of the slides w- was open. So the, the line moves a little slow. And here's the other thing. It's high up in the air. And um, like, it's a long walk up the stairs. Um, and at 40 now, it's daunting and someone who's afraid of heights. All right. My kids are with me, so I got to look strong and courageous as they're like, oh, aren't you scared of heights, dad? Like all this kind of stuff. Either way, uh, we, we make it up to the top. And just, just so you know, if you want to be humiliated, this is what you do. You ride this ride. Uh, because you get to the top and the first thing that they ask you to do, because apparently, um, so you're safe when you ride this thing, they have to take your weight. Yeah, some of you are like, what? I ain't doing that. Yep, they didn't tell me until I got up there. And uh, and so there's a saying, can you stand on this? And and I stood on it, and I'm like, who else is standing on this thing? Like, that is not the number that's at home. And then I started to think to myself, they need one that's more accurate, right? Because if the integrity of this ride is based on your actual weight, it can't lie. And so I'm like, that's a terrible number, right? And so, uh, but we go, we get ready to go down this thing, and... Um, if it's been a while since you've been to a water park, um, the the best practice for um, efficiency and safety is that there is water that's used for a water slide. Just want to make sure you know, like, like there's water. So one of the slides didn't have any water going. It was shut down. So we were all going down the other one. Um, I'm standing up in the front of the line. Riley and I are about to go next. And the, they changed out attendance. And the new attendant, um, I don't know, just was maybe oblivious and, um, set the first person, their first two up to go down the slide where the water is going. And then without even looking at the other slide, took the other group that's there and set them up to go down the slide where there's no water. And I'm thinking to myself, that's a bad idea. That I don't think that will work very well. And I'm like, is he really going to do this? Like, is he expecting it to turn on as soon as he pushes him over? Like, does he know what's going on? My faith was deteriorating in this moment on this guy's ability to know what he's doing. And uh, he literally, he about sent them over and then looks like, oh, there's no water. No kidding. Like, we all knew that. Like, how did you not see that? And so when I was about to get on this slide, I I couldn't let my son who was riding with me know, but I was terrified because my faith as we went through this thing got less and less because I don't think that guy knew what he was doing. So I definitely couldn't think he could do math with the numbers, the large numbers that were on the screen. And uh, either either way, um, for most you and I, our faith um, tends to fluctuate based on our experiences. And if you've had bad experiences, then your faith moving into something that's similar will be difficult. And so that's what we will 
we'll kind of see here today. So if you have your Bibles, Hebrews chapter 11, we're just going to do three verses today. Um, This is what it says. Verse one. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Hebrews chapter 11 gives us one of the most concise and clear definitions of what faith looks like. It is the assurance of things hoped for, and the conviction of things not seen. Now, faith for you and I is incredibly important. Like We need to understand it. And it's one of those words I think people just grow up in church here and says, yes, I have faith. And then people just assume that what we do here is just simply blind faith. It's for the ignorant. It's for the people who need something in their life. It's not rational or logical at all. You just believe in something that you cannot prove. And so you just kind of fall into that. You're closed-minded. And here's what happens. Faith is so important that we understand it to be that it is by faith that we have even salvation. Our faith in Jesus is what gives us justification. You read through the scriptures, you'll understand that it's faith that brings forth purification and sanctification. That faith in Jesus is what gives us righteousness. And that faith also is what brings us into the family of God through adoption. So all of the major theological words that I just threw out there find their root in faith. And so I'm guessing it probably matters. And I would argue that probably most of us in this room, if you've been in church for a while, have had moments where your faith has been encouraged and strong. And then there's been moments when your faith has been feeble and weak. And it's like a roller coaster ride. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give us just four things here. Four things that I think um, this faith in Hebrews chapter 11 is defining. So here's what it is. Here's number one. Faith is a confident assurance that underpins your trust in something or, or someone. It's a confident assurance. Assurance, knowing that whatever you have put your faith in or whoever you have put your faith in, you have this assurance deep down inside that what they promise will always come true. I'm going to give you an example of that. I'm going to have you turn to another verse real quick, if you would. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It'll go up on the screen as well if you don't want to turn. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18 says this. So we... Do not lose heart. Paul talking to the church of Corinth saying, we do not lose heart. Because whatever going on would cause someone to question, are they going to lose heart? So he says it, we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away. (laughs) Anyone feel that way? Mm -hmm. (laughs) That our outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. Um, for this light momentary affliction, I don't know if you've ever read some of what Paul describes as affliction in the Bible. I would argue, you, we all would probably agree that it doesn't seem light at all. Uh, yet the way he describes it as he's writing in this church is that this is just light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So he's literally saying that your faith in who Jesus is, is attaching you to something, a weight, a glory that's so greater and more infinite than you can ever imagine compared to especially what you are, you are going through. As we, verse 18, look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. The hardest thing, the hardest thing for us to comprehend as people who need the tangible is to trust in what is unseen. 
not one of us in this room have seen God. We have seen the effects of him. We have read the promises of him. We have seen him move, but we haven't seen him tangibly, which I believe is why, if, if I could, Jesus said, this is what you'll need, each other. What you'll need is each other to make what is intangible, tangible, because the church is defined as the hands and feet of Christ himself. Because God knew he wired us in such a way where we long for the tangible. It's why, it's why congregations, we had this conversation with, uh, um, uh, Chris and I had it with our, our family um, the last couple nights. It's why, it's why people have an unhealthy view of what church even is. It's why congregations have an unhealthy view of the pastor because what ends up happening is the pastor is the guy they look to, trust in, believe in. He's the man. He's the one. I'll go to church if he's there, that kind of thing. And what ends up happening is that you present the uh, pastor to be the tangible thing you're chasing when and what you need to have is a relationship with the intangible Jesus. You can't do it vicariously through the pastor. Because we have a hard time to trust in what is unseen. And Paul says here, listen, what gets me through the affliction is the unseen. What gets me through what's going on is the unseen. Because we know those are eternal. So it's a confident, a confident assurance that underpins your trust in, in God. You know, it's like something that's inside of you that just trusts he is who he says he is. Number two is this, that faith is based on conviction. Conviction, not experience. Um, and, and this conviction is derived from evidence and his spirit. Uh, okay, so I'll do it this way. I, here's what I guarantee. Uh, Every one of you in this room walked in here today and you sat down in the chair as you knew it was going to hold you. Like your experience has been, every time I've sat down, this chair holds me, right? Okay, so I just want to make sure. Uh, however, while I was on vacation, it may have something to do with the number that flashed on that screen up top of the ride. Uh, I go outside on the deck where I have been sitting most of the week in a metal chair, may I add. And I sit down on this metal chair and in an instant, it snaps and I hit the ground. And what makes matters worse is there was an audience, yes? My wife was there to watch this. My brother-in-law, sister -in -law, they saw this happen. And I, the entire house, I think, heard it happen because it felt like I fell from 10 feet in the air. most of if you've ever had something like that happen and you go to someone's house and there's a chair there that reminds you of the chair that you fell in, you're going to check it first. You ever sat in any wicker chair that failed you? You're going to check that chair again. Because a lot of people's faith is based on their experience. You go and trust that the surgeon is going to do what he says he's going to do because he's older and he is experienced. You ever got on a plane and saw the captain walk out who looks 16? They're like, is it bring your child to work day? <laughs> your faith lessens just a little bit because you're like, I don't know if I can trust this dude to fly this plane. If you examine most of our faith, it is based on experience. And what the Bible tells you and I is that our faith is not based on experience. It's actually based on one, conviction, and two, evidence. Conviction happens through his spirit, which we'll get to in the third one a little bit more, because you and I can't really muster up enough faith on our own. It needs to be gifted to us. But in this case, what we have is that there's a conviction inside of us that leads us to a hope that is certain. Some of you have been in situations and scenarios and circumstances where it seems like everything's falling apart, but there's still something that's keeping you stable. There's still 
something that's keeping you centered. And it's a conviction that comes from the faith in the one who is immovable. But there's also evidence. Unfortunately, which we'll get to towards the end, this evidence um, has kind of been put in question. The evidence is just look around. Look at the universe. Look at the fingerprints of God that have taken place throughout the creation or what he has designed. There is a major difference between biblical faith and experiential faith. It means I don't need to experience it to trust it. It means that even though life around me is falling apart and I understand the promises of God, I put my faith and trust in those, but I don't feel like I'm getting what I believe I should be getting. I don't question whether God is who he says he is because my faith is certain in him, even if everything around me is pointing otherwise. But what we have done is we had made we have made faith kind of what you experience when you walk in here we've associated it with the goosebumps that you get when people are singing loudly and hands raised and it's the song that you wanted to hear we associate god's presence with moments like this instead of every movement we make he's there with us but once again, we seek the experience. We seek the tangible. Um, look at Psalm. Uh, no, let's go to Romans uh, 1, 19 through 20. It's going to go up here on the screen. Romans 1, 19 through 20. Maybe. There it is. That's what it says. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and defined nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. What the Bible tells you and I in verse 20, so they are without excuse. What the Bible tells you and I is that everything around us points back to the creator. As, as you know, uh, so we were in North Georgia. Anyone ever been to North Georgia? I didn't know North Georgia existed. It was beautiful. We were by a lake where there's mountains and lake, and it was amazing. And um, the first question I asked, because I'm from Florida, and we're pretty close to Florida, is because um, we're going to swim in this lake, is are there, are there gators, gators in the lake? Because uh, in Florida, we swam in lakes where there are gators. That was just normal. But I had to adjust because I've been away from it for a while. And uh, apparently, there's a certain line that they don't cross. I'm like, that takes faith. i just let you know. No, uh, they'd never cross that line. Like never once did an alligator make a trip past that line. I don't know. Wasn't going to find out. Uh, but either way, it was beautiful. Here's what I do know. When God designed that area to hold that water, he put the water there and he said, stay. And the water listened. You ever been to the ocean? Stand on the shore? The water comes so far in and goes back out, the ebb and flow. God designed that to be so. And the water never goes where it's not told to go. We did a wedding while we were gone. This wedding, the reception was on this beautiful dock that went out to the water. And uh, as the night progressed, the water started to rise and the deck part that we were on started to go underwater. And so I looked at the people who were running the thing, I was like, hey, is this normal? Like, yeah, this is this happens. It, the tide comes in and the deck goes underwater. It's like only once or twice a year does the entire thing uh, flood because of a king tide. I was like, cool, we're safe. No, no, it was definitely that weekend. Uh, we're there and the water continues to rise and rise and rise. My wife and I leave early because I'm a pastor. I got to leave before the debauchery happens at every reception. Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. Uh, and so I, I, it's been a while since I've been up here, guys. Let's let, give me some time. Uh, so we, we leave and uh, uh, we, we turn right out of the place and the water was uh, past our wheels as we're driving down this road. I'm like, this is terrifying because it's dark out. And uh, come to find out later that the entire place flooded. They didn't care. They rolled up their pants and danced in the water. I'm like, that's cool. 
glad I wasn't there, but that's awesome. And, uh, and so this, this is what happened. Like the flood came in. Here's who, you know who wasn't surprised? God. Like we were all kind of taken back. Nothing has ever happened in creation that God did not say, go do this. And listen, y'all remember Jonah? God told a whale, go swallow, I'm sorry, a fish, to go swallow Jonah. Guess who listened? The fish. Guess who didn't listen in the story? The man. Well, the man who represents all humanity, okay, not just men, uh, didn't listen. Either way. So it took some of you a little bit to catch on to that one. We're, we're on the same page. All right. All of creation, all of creation listens to the voice of God. And then humanity. And God says, go do this. And we say no. God places within us in this faith, this conviction, the evidence all around to listen, to obey his voice. And, and we have the audacity to say no. And here's what I need to tell you. Because faith that we have is derived from his presence within us, what ends up happening is that the more and more you say no, the more and more you'll see your faith decrease because you begin to silence the voice of the Holy Spirit, which is a very scary place. Number three is this. That faith is faith is a gift. I'm, I'm thankful it is, and this is this is the paradox people have have, have uh, a struggle with is that okay? So God gives us the faith. Yeah, He gives us the faith. Um, how, where do you get that from? So if you would, it's in Ephesians chapter two. It'll go up on the screen. I'll, I'll read it uh, to you. It's a very familiar passage of the scripture. Most of you will know this. Ephesians chapter two, starting in verse eight, it says uh, this that for by grace, you have been saved through faith. So by grace, through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. That even the faith that we have through the grace of God is a gift that we have been given. What that means is that the gift of of, well, the faith that you have has been given to you by God to believe in who he says he is. Now, um, this is a struggle for a lot of people because like, well, does that make us a puppet? No. Because here's what happens. The gift has been given to everyone to receive. It's just some people choose not to receive it. Some people see the amazing gifts like, nah, you know, that doesn't seem logical. That seems a bit irrational to me. Um, I can't, I can't make that, that jump. Thank you, though, and walk away from it. But I'm thankful that the one who gives us the faith and when you receive it strengthens you and that we know through Galatians that the faith is actually one of the attributes of the Spirit. One of the fruits of the Spirit. And so when your faith that you have starts to lessen and weaken, God's spirit comes around it and says, don't worry, I got you, I'm here. And so that when you pray for someone who's struggling and you say, listen, I don't have the faith to pray that this can be removed, but Jesus, I am praying in your name and through your faith, even though our faith is weak, I know your faith is strong, so will you continue to show yourself faithful time and time again? That's so why when the centurion soldier said, I, I have belief, will you help my unbelief? This is something that God does in us. And the problem is we spend more time on the tangible. And when you spend more time on the tangible, and you spend less time trusting in God's words, your faith begins to lessen because, well, you've taken your eyes off of your steadfast shore anchor and moved it on to the things that are temporal. And so faith begins to fluctuate. Um, and, and number four, number four is this, uh, that faith is believing God, not simply believing in God. And I, I I, there's just one word that separated that statement. 
Faith is believing God, not believing in God. We live in a day and age in a culture that tries to tell you that your biggest step is to believe that God exists. Listen, I'm here to tell you, he exists whether or not you choose to believe it or not. The Bible is true and certain whether you have faith in it or not. It doesn't. Your faith doesn't dictate whether God is there. Your faith doesn't dictate whether the Bible is true. Those things are reality. Reality. Your choice is whether to believe that voice or not because he is there. And what ends up happening, we're trying to compete with the culture around us, trying to do what God has been able to do for himself all along, and that is to prove in his existence. I don't need to do that. I just need to tell you, Jesus is real. He's there. And if you want to live a, a life that starts to eliminate some of the havoc and some of the pain and some of the suffering and starts to give you a joy that you never thought possible, and here's what you need to do. Stop trying to guess whether he's there or not and believe that he is, and then start to listen to his voice. Well, how do you do that? Well, just listen to his words. Start there. Most, most people, most people actually haven't put in the effort to do the proving whether he exists or not. They just listen to all the noise around us and regurgitate it. Because here's what I've learned about God is that if you are faithful in your pursuit of God, are you really there? He's faithful to respond. I've seen it. I've watched it happen. Talk about uh, seeing uh, God and his faithfulness invade the hearts of people who are questioning whether or not he's there. I've seen it happen. Evidences of God's spirit moving amongst his people. It's believing God, not believing in him. It's why, it's why I think we don't see the word faith in the Old Testament, but twice. Because they just chose to listen or not. Now, our, our conclusion is this. Go back to Hebrews 3, 11, 11, verse 3. Don't get excited that I said conclusion, though. <laughs> Hebrews 11, verse 3. By faith we understand, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. I find it interesting and ironic that the first example that's used before we get into the men and women of faith, the first example, the first illustration that we see is the writer of Hebrews pointing back to, here's how we know. Here's how faith works. It's trusting in that God created everything by his words. And why I find that interesting, you may ask? Here's why. Because the very enemy that is around us, our culture at large, has spent the vast amount of time and effort and energy to debunk and discredit the most clear and concise evidence of God's existence, both in his presence and his power, and that is the creation of the universe. Do you know how much effort and energy has been put into evolution, discrediting that there's a designer, or worse, combining the two? If we understand, listen to me, this is very important. If we understand Genesis 1 and 2 rightly, if we, if we see the immense amount of signs in the universe that point back to its creator, if we believe that God is the designer of it all, it will eventually and inevitably bring people to the cross. The death and resurrection of Jesus become more comprehensible and approachable through the lenses of God creating the universe. So it makes sense why our enemy has caused people to question the creation of it all. Because he knows if you believe in a designer, if you believe in creation, you are on the pathway to believing in the cross. And he did everything he could to get the cross from happening. You know that? Right before Jesus starts his ministry, Satan himself shows up, tempts him three times. He tries to get Jesus, the son of the living God, 
the second person of the Trinity. He tries to get the one who was there from the beginning, who was not created, who was the voice that helped create everything. He tried to get Jesus, who is the embodiment of the words of God, to ignore, deny the words of God. To go a different route. And Satan failed. So, he tries to do it through pain as Jesus falls down in the garden of Gethsemane with the weight of all of humanity's sin bearing on his shoulders. Satan wanted him to feel every bit of that in hopes that Jesus would not go to the cross. He tries at the beginning. He tries at the end. And Jesus still went to the cross. And then he tried to get everyone convinced that death was victory and that there's no way Jesus would resurrect. And then three days later, Jesus resurrects. And he's alive and well. And he provides for you and I the way to have salvation. So Satan tried to get rid of the cross, and he couldn't. So what does he spend his time on? Getting people to not believe in creation. And if he can do that, then he'll detour people from the cross. Because they're almost tell you, if you believe in the beginning was God, and if you believe that God was able to speak all things in existence through his words, then when you fast forward a little bit to Jesus coming and walking on water, you're like, of course he can. He created it. When you get to the part where he opens the eyes of a blind man, you're like, yeah. Like he's the one that can do that. He gives us all sight. When you understand that Jesus was there at the beginning to create all things by his word, then everything else following makes sense. And you get to the cross and Jesus says, hey, you can't come to the Father except through me. You're like, okay, because you say it, I believe it. Because if you can speak things into existence and you can come down and be born of a virgin and you can live a life that shows us miracle after miracle, then guess what? I'm gonna believe your words. And if your words say, I need to trust in you to have, uh, to have life in God, then I'm in. You think it's a one, I don't, I don't, I don't get, I don't get political, but I'm going to say this. There's a reason. There's a reason our culture is trying to snuff out everything that points to a designer. We're not, they're not out to get us. Like, all this stuff that's going on. This is a light affliction compared to the weight of glory we will have if we get our eyes off of what we're seeing in the tangible and get our eyes on the intangible, understanding that our place isn't to prove in God's existence and our place isn't definitely to argue with those who are on a different side than us. Our place, our position is to point to Jesus Christ because he was in the beginning, he is in the end, he is the victor of all. So it's still Jesus. So with that, um, don't need to say that. <laughs> the, the Big Bang evolution is deduced by looking backwards because there was no one there as a witness to these things. And the further back you look, the more faith it takes to substantiate this theory. And you'll eventually get to a point where you have to admit that something invisible, incomprehensible, played a part in creating what is visible. You get to a place where even if you go to the Big Bang Theory, you go all the way back, okay, all this kind of blew up and expanded, but where did it come from? We don't know. 
who caused it to explode. We really don't know that. So you're saying there's something that happened at the very beginning, that something intangible, invisible helped with what we see as visible and tangible. You have to come to that conclusion. And so then my question is, let's go, let's start from the back end. Is there a place that tells us that there was something invisible that made something visible? Well, I got an answer for you. There is. It's found in Hebrews chapter 11, the very words of God that are true. Verse three, by faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made by things that are visible. So we got an answer. It's, it's disheartening for me because the new stats are 40% of the U.S. adults ascribe, only 40%, ascribe to a strictly creationist view. And 33% or in 22% either believe in evolution or believe in a combination. What's even more disheartening is that the American worldview inventory in 2020 found that the number of Americans who believe that the Bible is true is down to 21%. So here's what's crazy. It may seem like the enemy's winning, but once again, he's not. He's doing everything possible to distract and detour people, but the promise still stands that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Well, and, and, and what is the basis of that church, you may ask? It is that we stand on the grace of God through faith in him. And so what we get to do for the rest, the rest of the summer, is see how faith empowered people to even plow through their own failures their own fears, their own trauma, their own ups and downs, but still know that God is who he says he is and will always come through. Will you stand with me? We're going to end in singing. Um, there's, always, there's always an opportunity. Will you stop interrupting me with the chairs? I'm just saying just kidding. Just kidding. There's always, uh, there's always people who will pray with you. We did a prayer time in the middle. Um, if, if you want prayer, we're, st we're still here for that. We're going to do a song, though, where I, I want you to focus on, if you would, just singing the words of the song. It, it kind of aligns with how we concluded this. It allows us people to worship together, one voice, one heart, telling God how great he is. And so my hope for you over the next several months, several weeks, is that your faith will be increased, not, not because you have been able to increase it, but because you finally surrendered to the one who will. It's never been about how big your faith is. You know that Jesus said that if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, and a mustard seed is really small, what matters is who your faith is in. It can be small as a mustard seed, but it's in Jesus. And guess what? He will come through. So let's sing this together as we end this service. Father, we love you. We thank you. Have your way in this moment. I pray that you are pleased with the voices that will arise in this moment. That'll be a sweet sound. It will be creation, your creation, those who you have created with your own words intricately woven in our mother's wombs that, that when we sing it pleases you to hear those who you have given breath use it to give you praise we love you Thank you for listening to Crosslink Community Church Podcast. If you would like more information about our church, please visit our website at www.crosslinkchurch.com or join us in person on Sunday mornings at 1020 a.m. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss a single message and share with a friend. Thank you again for listening.